Welcome to an extremely brief history of philosophy with special reference to the metaphysics of God. There's a catchy title for you. With me, your host, Dr. Tarasenko. Episode 1, The Origins of Philosophy, Socrates and Plato. As soon as I can figure out how to add theme music to this, we'll have theme music someday. This video is for anybody who is interested in philosophy and wants an extremely brief history of it. It also will be useful to people studying for the AQA philosophy exam, A-level exam in the UK, the metaphysics of God component in that exam. But both categories should be satisfied by watching this video series. So what is philosophy again? How did philosophy start? Who was the first philosopher? Ponder those questions for yourself for a moment. If you're watching this in a classroom, which you might be, this might be a good time to pause the video and talk about what you think the answer to those questions are. Here are some answers. So philosophy, well, the trouble is that lots of, there are lots of different definitions of philosophy because philosophers like to argue about what philosophy actually is. Is, is that sort of a, a thing that philosophers can't actually agree on what it is? That's very typical of philosophy. If you want to think etymologically, philosophy, probably invented by Pythagoras as a word, uh, the, the Greek thinker, who also gave us uh, laws of geometry and um, trigonometry, that's the one I was looking for, uh, originally the word means in Greek love philo of wisdom Sophia so love of wisdom is philosophy but that's very broad isn't it what does is, what does wisdom mean how do you love it what does love of wisdom look like um, yeah so philosophers actually argue about what love of wisdom is and what philosophy is one definition is to say that it is thinking logically about fundamental in the sense of deep ultimate um, non-surface level questions about the universe and things. That's just one, that's the working definition I'll adopt for this set of videos, thinking logically about fundamental questions. You could use others. One writer defines philosophy as thinking in slow motion. Um, another, I believe Alvin Pan Plantinga, calls it just thinking really hard about things. But I hope that gives you the gist. And if you've clicked onto a video series about philosophy, you probably have some idea what it's about but thinking carefully about deep fundamental questions about the universe. And humans have probably done this since they could think logically, haven't they? Whether you're a creationist and you think they've been thinking logically since 4004 BCE, or you believe in evolution and think that at some point we were able to think logically, that's probably when philosophy started. However, sometimes the Greek Thales of Miletus in 7th, 6th century BCE is called the first philosopher and named the first philosopher by historians of philosophy and other people indeed who were around at his time because of his metaphysical ideas. Thales incidentally thought that the entire world was made out of water, which is patently wrong, isn't it? But the point is he was speculating about a fundamental question. What is the world made out of? That's a metaphysical question. We'll define metaphysics later, I'm sure. And so he was doing philosophy. Who was the first philosopher in the West though? Well, Thales is still in the West, but the, the first major philosopher is one who is so important to philosophy that in the history of philosophy, people before him are called the pre-him. Who is that? Well, you're quite right. It is Socrates. It was Socrates and later his student Plato. These are really the most important first philosophers to look at in an extremely brief history of philosophy because it really all starts properly with them. So Socrates, in the 5th century BCE, before Common Era, asked people in ancient Greece difficult questions about what they meant by certain words and dialogued with them. That's how he did philosophy, apparently, according to, to Plato. He was then put to death by the government of his time for corrupting the young men of Athens. They didn't like the ideas that he was spreading. They thought he was spreading political dissension. There might have been some questions around his, his sexual activity perhaps there as well. Um, I'm sure some philosophy professors would get cross with me saying that, but for whatever reason, yeah, he was seen he was seen as subversive and he was put to death by the, the government. However, his favourite student up here in the top right, Plato, wrote up some of his discussions in dialogues, or at least he was inspired by his mentor, Socrates, to create some dialogues, some philosophical dialogues, uh, um, and write them down, in which he put forward... Socrates, arguably, and 
certainly in some form his own ideas and these are extremely famous some of them not all of them are the republic mino fido symposium apology Thytetus parmenides euthyphro and timaeus i underline euthyphro for those aqa philosophy a level students because that's one of the dialogues that comes up and it comes up in metaphysics of god that's the dialogue where socrates asks what is piety what is holiness is it defined by the gods or are they themselves answerable to a standard of piety? And you can translate that in modern language into the Euthyphro dilemma, as it's come to be known, which is, does God, if there is a God, decide what is good or is God himself answerable to a standard of goodness? And neither option seems satisfactory for religious people. So it's a dilemma, a conundrum, a problem with two equally difficult options. Plato, by the way, is the most influential ancient philosopher and the most influential philosopher of all time. That's pretty much undisputed. It's, it's Plato, Kant and Aquinas up there, according to most people. I mean, you know, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy has Plato in the, in the web address. So you can't get much more famous than that in philosophy to be in the web address for, for the Stanford Encyclopedia. Um, Alfred North Whitehead even called Western, the whole of Western philosophy a series of footnotes to Plato. I'm saying that word Western because remember we're talking about European and Western think thought. This isn't about Eastern philosophy. If you want to learn about that, go and watch another YouTube video series on that. Okay, so let's talk about the allegory of the cave. I'm not going to hope to explain all of Plato's ideas to you. As we go through these philosophers in this extremely brief history, I'll just be picking out one or two ideas that are of special relevance to thinking about God and the metaphysics of God. So here's one idea from Plato. Here's probably Pl Plato's most famous idea and famous story, really, because this is a story that turns up in his text, The Republic. He, in that text, presents what's known as an allegory, so a story with a double meaning of, of the cave. And it begins with some people who are sat in a cave, chained up, watching shadows on a wall. And these shadows are created by the projection of light from a fire falling on objects which are moved along behind these prisoners in the cave so that their shadows are thrown on the wall. One day, one of the prisoners is released from his chains, realises he's in the cave only watching shadows, sees the objects that the the shadows are are coming from and manages to make his way up and out of the cave to escape from it out into the real world beyond well actually the cave's still real in the sense i'm jumping from one allegorical sense to another but in the story world um they're just as real as each other but he, he emerges from the cave it's definitely a he for plato i'm afraid into the the world outside and sees objects outside of the cave for the first time looks around sees the sky and is eventually even to able once his eyes adjust to see the sun outside the cave what is the point of this story this story illustrates plato's theory of the forms let me explain so plato's doctrine teaching or theory of the forms runs thus plato believed that there exists an invisible world where there are perfect versions of different kinds of material things known as forms. So for example, there are many tables in the visible world. In the invisible world, there is a form of a table. The perfect table is like the conceptual perfect table from which all other tables derive their tableness. There are many dogs in this world of different kinds. There is in the world of the forms, a form of the dog, an invisible conceptual perfect version of a dog, which all dogs derive their dogness from. There's a form of a woman, a man, a headphone set, a laptop, I suppose we'd have to say. Everything that exists, exists also in the world of the forms as a generalized conceptual invisible version of itself. Plato actually believed that these exist. How does his story of the cave relate to this? Well, in the story of the cave, he's, he's illustrating this idea in the following way. The shadows in the cave represent material objects as we experience them in our everyday sense experience so through sight touch taste smell and feeling things when when we when we see things when we see tables and dogs and women and all the other things that we experience because our experience is not restricted to only those things that is represented in the story by the shadows in the cave the outside world that the prisoner is liberated 
unto and able to experience once their eyes adjust to it is the world of the forms now this world is only visible if only visible excuse me to philosophers who have been freed from the shadowy illusions of the cave so once you start doing philosophy and if this is your first time doing philosophy you are having your chains released chains released from you at this very moment as i speak and being liberated you become able to see into the true nature of things into the true nature of reality and look beyond the shadowy transience of normal everyday experience and start and you become you're going to be able to start to experience the world of the forms things as they as they really are the concepts generalized perfect forms of things beyond sense or beyond sense experience that's what philosophers do according to plato and the best philosophers the supreme way of doing philosophy is to be able to contemplate the equivalent of the sun in real life which is plato's form of the good this is the highest most perfect form the good which is the source of the existence of all the other forms and only philosophers can learn to see this with much training says plato and they should in fact be set aside at a certain point in their life so that they can train as philosophers and be able to do this and then they should be the ones ruling the world as philosopher kings even though they don't want to because they just want to contemplate the form of the good they're the best people to run society of course because they're how might this connect to the metaphysics so of god metaphysics we might as well define now meta is a greek word which can mean after or beyond phusis just means nature originally so my understanding of metaphysics is that which is beyond nature that which is supernatural in other words that is which lies beyond our natural sense experience so the forms are metaphysical by definition what about god because we're doing this with special reference to metaphysics of god have a think pause it, this video if you need to to think about how the forms might connect to the metaphysics of god and now i'll tell you so some suggestions the form of the good has similarities to god doesn't it it's supreme it's the mystical source of truth and knowledge it's the ground of being in plato because all other forms derive their existence from it and itself can be known in some way in some mystical contemplative way so platonic thought for this reason and others has been hugely influential on the metaphysics of god and the philosophy of religion another name for the metaphysics of god neoplatonism which was new at the time which was quite why it's called neoplatonism but is no longer new had many interactions with early christianity and made this connection between the form of the, the good and god so they're very similar the form of the good and god aren't they in more modern times this connection has been made as well Let's take for example the 20th century writer c.s lewis who wrote i believe in christianity as i believe that the sun has risen not only because i see it but because by it i see everything else allusions there to the sun in the allegory of the cave and plato's form of the good that's very platonic also you can back this up because he in his children's book the last battle part of the chronicles of narnia uh, in the mouth of, of a professor by the way it's a professor who has the wardrobe that narnia is inside says it's all in plato all in plato bless me what do they teach them at these schools so in other words there are lots of similarities between the form of the good in plato and god in religion in particular in christianity although there are important differences as well because the god of christianity has personality and ver and all sorts of other things which mean that it he excuse me diverges from plato at the same time the similarities were enough that neoplatonism could evolve which synthesized christianity and plato and writers like c.s lewis could draw out this distinction this theme will reappear later on in this video series so why does plato actually believe in these forms well according to professor christopher shields who's an expert on ancient philosophy and who i'm using purely because i went to school with his son and i've heard him speak on plato a few times plato offers an epistemological that's to do with the theory of knowledge and a metaphysical that's to do with reality beyond what we can see argument for the theory of the forms here's the metaphysical argument and i'm interested in what you think of it premise one oh and this seems as good a time as any to explain that for analytic that is generally english-speaking more mathematical 
by its own claim uh, more logically rigorous philosophy philosophy proceeds on the basis of arguments which are put forward usually in the form of premises and conclusions a premise being merely a statement or claim about the world and a conclusion being also a premise but a premise that has emerged by process of logical inference between the other preceding premises in the argument the best way to understand what that is is perhaps to simply see it in action so here we go premise one and a premise is just a statement or claim about the world if x x can be anything here if x is a p so if x falls into the category we're inventing which we can just call p for now and y is a p then there is something penis oh dear that was a bit unfortunate never mind penis which is the same in x and y if i was in a classroom i would have two pens and i would say if x this one pen is a p a pen and this other pen y is also a pen also a p there is something penness let's call it penness maybe instead of penis that was extremely unfortunate i should have test run this before out loud which yeah, there there is something that is penness which is the same in both places for both the first pen and the second pen premise two claim two if x and y are in different places then they therefore share no it's actually sorry it's not a therefore yet then they share something penis which is altogether present in different places so in other words if i had a pen in my right hand and in my left hand x and y and they were both pens they both have the property p then there is something that property penness which is present in my right hand and my left hand in different places premise three no physical object no physical object can be present in different places at one time that just seems highly intuitive you cannot have an object which occupies at the same time this space and also that space it, it just doesn't happen objects are in one space at a time in reality conclusion one therefore penis or penness that property we described in premise one and two cannot be a physical object conclusion two therefore hence penness or penness is an abstract object therefore it's something which exists because we saw it's in more than one place at the same time but it can't be physical it must be abstract so there are abstract objects general properties of things which nonetheless exist which are immaterial and invisible abstract which the name for these is form that's one argument second argument here's plato's epistemological argument for the theory of the forms as put forward by professor shields premise one knowledge things that we know is of what is precise and unchanging if you know something that doesn't just change so for example if you know one plus one equals two that's precise it's exact and it also doesn't change depending on what day of the week it is it's always the case that one plus one equals two plato would say such a thing premise two however objects of sense things that we experience in our sense experience are imprecise and changing i'm looking out the window now i can see leaves fluttering around and the sky is gray later on it will be dark and i won't be able to see the leaves and actually the sky will look blue bluer even sorry or black the sky will have will have darkened these things change and it's hard to describe them as precisely as more secure objects of knowledge like one plus one equals two which will still be the same later on this evening this is plato's argument you don't have to agree with it Conclusion one, hence, therefore, objects of sense are not objects of knowledge. These two things can't be the same. Things that we know securely and things that are part of our sense experience. Conclusion two, hence, therefore, objects of knowledge are abstract entities. So we can know these things, but because they're not imprecise and changing, they're not objects of knowledge so they must be abstract entities this is a strange argument i know but this is how professor shields presents plato's case conclusion three hence therefore if we have knowledge at all and surely we do we have knowledge of abstract entities which we can call forms in other words the things that we really know 
are precise and unchanging, and therefore they're abstract, unlike our non-abstract, imprecise and changing objects of sense. These things are different, therefore these things are abstract. The abstract, immaterial, invisible, generalized, conceptual things that we know are forms. This is a summary of why Plato thinks there are forms. What do you think? Does the argument work? Do the forms exist? In certain corners of the philosophical world today, the idea of the forms has become highly unfashionable and to posit a metaphysical, beyond the natural world, realm of generalized conceptual immaterial forms sounds like ridic so sounds ridiculous to many people today. Some people still want to hold on to them though. Some people want to return to them. Some ancient philosophers, some more modern Neoplatonists, some people still are trying to synthesize Christianity with Platonism in a philosophical way. What do you think? Do the arguments for the forms work? Are you going to be someone who believes in the forms and is an innatist like Plato, some, someone who thinks that these, our, our capacity for apprehending these forms is inborn? The choice is yours. Comment below, like and subscribe. Tune in next time for more in this extremely brief history of philosophy.